Hi everyone and thank you for joining us for our webinar on jail inmate records held in the New South Wales State Archives collection. Before I begin, on behalf of Museums of History in New South Wales, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and future and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Today, I'm presenting this webinar on the land of the Darug people. So to begin, I'm going to quickly cover some background information about corrective services in New South Wales, so you can understand a bit more about these records and who created them. New South Wales jails have been controlled by a variety of agencies throughout the last few centuries. The first temporary jail in New South Wales was built in 1797, with Parramatta Jail soon following a year later as the first official jail in New South Wales. The Provost Marshal was responsible for the operation of the jail, tasked with holding criminal offenders awaiting trial in custody, as well as carrying out all the orders and judgments of the courts. This included the imprisonment, punishment and execution of all criminal offenders when instructed. The Provost Marshal was replaced by the Sheriff in 1823, assuming the same responsibilities in regard to jails in the colony. This office would operate in this function until 1874 with the formation of the Department of Prisons, where all jails were placed under the control of the Comptroller General of Prisons. In 1875, a year after his appointment, this would include 37 jails across the state. This time period was characterised by harsh and extreme methods of punishments that would be considered inhumane today, with a Royal Commission into the ill treatment of prisoners at Berrimah Jail being held in 1878. However, this began to change around the turn of the, of the century with the appointment of Frederick Neitenstein as Comptroller General, known for his prison reforms and his introduction of the New South Wales classification system. Here we have a map of all the operating jails in New South Wales in 1900. You can see that they have been categorised into three different types. Principal or major jails, such as Darlinghurst and Goulburn, minor jails, such as Young or Armadale, and police jails, such as Wellington or Orange. As records about inmates were created by the jail itself, our holdings can differ greatly between different institutions. We are likely to hold more records relating to a major jail like Goulburn than a minor or police jail. Corrective services under the larger Department of Communities and Justice are currently the responsible agency for the administration of New South Wales jails. Before we tackle the different kinds of records we hold, I wanted to go over a few common terms that appear in our jail records and what they may mean for your inmate. When someone is remanded, it means that they are a defendant in custody, especially when a child has been adjourned. When someone has been released by remission, it indicates that the length of their sentence or number of sentences has been reduced. When someone has been released on licence, it means that they have been released early, subject to conditions specified in the set licence. Conditions may include, for example, staying in the same area for a certain amount of time. When someone's sentence is commuted, it has been reduced to a less severe one. For example, you'll often see this term used when the death penalty sentence has been reduced or commuted to imprisonment for life. Here are some common abbreviations that are also used within the jail records and can help you decipher all the available information. HL equals hard labour and is used to indicate the kind of imprisonment an inmate has been sentenced with. BC and BS can be found alongside identifying information and indicate that the inmate was born in the colony or in the state. And the last four abbreviations indicate the different levels of court an inmate may have been sentenced in. So PS equals the Court of Petty Sessions, PC equals the Police Court, QS means the Quarter Sessions, which is now known as the District Court, and SC or CC can mean the Supreme Court or Central Criminal Court, so the highest court level in the state. It would be remiss of me not to acknowledge that New South Wales Corrective Services is just one part of the state's larger criminal justice system. Anyone who has been incarcerated would have first had interactions with both the New South Wales Police and New South Wales Courts. While the New South Wales State Archives Collection holds records from all aspects of the criminal justice system, 
This webinar is only going to be focusing on our records relating to jail inmates and prisoners. Note that jail records are closed to public access for 70 years. If you're interested in viewing jail inmate records created within the last 70 years, you will first need to obtain permission from the New South Wales Department of Communities and Justice. So, what kind of jail inmate records can be found in the New South Wales State Archives collection? While our holdings for jails can differ depending on the individual jail and time period, some of the typical jail inmate records you might expect to find include entrance books, description books, entrance and description books, discharge books, prisoner cards, and photographic description books or sheets. We hold jail entrance books in our collection dating back as early as 1819. These books record details of prisoners who have entered into an individual jail. While the information provided in these records differs over time, they can tell you identifying information about the prisoner, including their name, age, religion, place of birth and ship of arrival, as well as details about their crime, including their offence and sentence, the presiding magistrate who handled their case, their jail number and date of entry into the jail, any prior or subsequent entrance numbers, as well as details about their disposal from the jail, when and where they went. Here we have one of our earliest examples of an entrance book for Sydney Jail from 1823. Each line represents a new prisoner entering the jail. The information provided in this record is not as extensive as later entrance books, but still tells us a lot of interesting information. For example, the entry relating to Felix Hall tells us that he entered the jail on the 2nd of April 1823 and was a free man who arrived in the colony on the vessel The Fanny. He was charged with the offence of highway robbery for stealing a bag and a bottle of rum from a William Newport. He was fined five pounds and was incarcerated for four months until he was released on the 13th of August 1823 as per the orders of the colonial secretary. Here we have a later example of an entrance book dated 1893 from Broken Hill Jail. Listed in red is the entrance of Mary Murray on the 4th of July to the jail, accompanied by her child Arthur at only one and a half years of age. She was charged with being drunk and disorderly and was sentenced to either pay five shillings or undergo 48 hours of imprisonment. Since she left the jail on the 6th of July, two days later, we can determine that she did not end up paying the fine. You may be wondering why Mary is singled out as the only person on the page whose details are provided in red ink. This is something we see across many of the jail records from this time period and later, and indicates that Mary is a female prisoner the only woman listed on the page. Entries like this demonstrate the value of these jail records, as it is likely the only surviving record of this short incarceration. We don't hold any relevant court of petty sessions records for this area and time period, and newspapers were unlikely to report on such minor charges. Description books were complementary records to the jail entrance books. These books provide further descriptive and identifying information for each prisoner. Our description books date from as early as 1831 and as late as 1908. Along with the same information provided in the entrance books, including jail number, name, ship of arrival, age, religion and place of birth, these records provide additional information, such as their trade, physical description, including their height, complexion, hair and eye colour, level of education, and any physical marks or special features. In this example, also from Broken Hill Jail in 1893, we learn further information about a jail inmate named Annie McKenzie. Annie was a married woman of 28 years of age and no education. She was of the Roman Catholic religion and fairly short at only four feet, 11 inches tall. She is described as being of medium build with a sallow complexion and having brown hair and grey eyes. Of note are scars on her right temple and on the bridge of her nose. A mole can be found on the right side of her chin. We would need to locate the complimentary entrance book to learn more about exactly when and why Annie was incarcerated. 
Jails started combining the information provided in the separate entrance and description books into a singular record around the turn of the 20th century. Later entries in these records can also tell us details of assistance provided by the Prisoners Aid Association, as well as whether an inmate was an Aboriginal or a Torres Strait Islander. As you can see from this example, these combined entrance and description books are much larger and provide a great amount of detail about the inmates. The first register entry on the page relates to a Samuel Willis, who entered into Wagga Wagga Jail on the 26th of July, 1905. Samuel was the 43-year-old bootmaker with grey hair to match his grey eyes and scars on his right ear, left arm and shins of both legs. Charged with the offence of indecent language, Willis was instructed to either pay a fine of £30 or undergo one month of hard labour. Annotations on his register entry reveal that he left the jail on the 23rd of August 1905, almost a full month later than he entered, with the fine partially paid. Discharge books are also one of the most prevalent jail records in our collection. Many of the details provided overlap with the entrance and description books, noting a prisoner's name, jail number, ship and year of arrival, details of their offence, sentence and conviction, as well as details of their discharge from the jail. Later volumes may also tell you the birth date of a prisoner. Here we have an example of a discharge book from Maitland Jail dated 1880. Listed in this discharge book are details regarding an Amelia Britt who was convicted for the offence of lunacy in the Maitland Police Court. This conviction may seem a bit strange from a modern perspective, but during this time period, people were regularly incarcerated from suffering from mental illness, being charged with lunacy, homelessness, being charged with vagrancy or addiction, being charged with being an inebriate, with suicide attempts even being tried as a crime in the higher courts. Amelia would only spend a few days in Maitland Jail after her conviction before she was sent to the Gladesville Asylum in Sydney for treatment. And finally, we get to everyone's favourite jail record, the photographic description sheets. These records record a lot of the same information we have been seeing in our other typical records with the key additions of any known aliases of the prisoner, details of their previous convictions and, of course, a photograph of the inmate in question. The practice of photographing jail inmates began in 1870 at Darlinghurst Jail under the instructions of the Comptroller General. Inmates were to be photographed to reflect their ordinary appearance as much as was practical, being instructed to wear their private clothing when still available, and not being allowed to be shaved or clipped prior to their photograph being captured. The practice of photographing prisoners would slowly spread across to other New South Wales jails throughout the next few decades. The New South Wales State Archives collection holds jail photographs dating to the very beginning of this practice in 1870. While there are gaps in the records, with some photographs from individual jails not surviving, we have digitised and indexed over 52,000 jail photographs in our collection, dating between 1870 and 1930. We hold physical copies of jail photographs from 1930 onwards. If you're looking for a jail photograph from this time period, we would recommend contacting us for assistance with your search via our email at collections at mhnsw.au. Please be aware that not everyone who was incarcerated was photographed. Photographs were limited to prisoners who were tried in the high courts for serious offences, for example, the Supreme Court or the Court of Quarter Sessions, or for prisoners who were to serve a sentence of six months or more. Inebriates, who were constantly in and out of jail for charges of drunkenness, were also to be photographed. It is worth noting that prisoners who were acquitted for their crimes were to have their jail photograph destroyed. Here we have an example of a typical jail photographic description sheets that you might find in our collection. This photo of Jules Caesar Bertha was taken on the 23rd of February 1907 and the accompanying sheet tells us a bit more about Jules and how he ended up in jail. Originally from France, Jules was working as a mechanic in Australia prior to his arrest for larceny in 1907. We can see that this was Jules' first conviction in Australia, occurring in the Sydney Court of Quarter Sessions and resulted in a sentence of two years hard labour. The jail has also provided quite a detailed written description of Jules and his key characteristics. He is described in the following terms. Hair thin on crown of head, 
chest very hairy with hair across the shoulders, shoulder blades and back hairy. Not the most flattering description, although I love that they deemed it necessary to note for future identification purposes. Here we have another jail photograph for an Annie Burns. You can see from her long list of convictions that she's been in and out of the lower courts for years on charges of drunkenness, indecent language, riotous behaviour and vagrancy. At this point in time, she has accumulated several aliases, all of which are listed at the top of the sheet. What I really love about this jail photographic description sheet is how much Annie's personality shines through, from her loud and boldly patterned clothing to the detailed descriptions of her various tattoos. These tattoos include an I Love Patty tattoo on her left arm, an I Love JJ on her forearm, a Mother Deer on her arm, and my favourite, an I Love Jack Halliday tattoo with a star on her forearm. This description also notes that Annie is missing six teeth from her top jaw, which after a second glance of her photograph becomes really clear. Photographic description sheets can also provide annotations which can help shed some more light on the jail inmate and what may have happened to them after their conviction. Here we have the jail photograph for Louisa Collins, who you may be familiar with as the last woman ever hanged in New South Wales. Louisa was convicted for the murder of her second husband, Mr. William Collins, after both he and her first husband were discovered to have died from arsenic poisoning under suspicious circumstances. Her jail photographic description sheet contains a comment from the Chief Justice. In the remarks section is a statement. His Honour, the Chief Justice Darley said, I hold no hope of mercy for you on earth. Louisa was executed shortly afterwards. Lastly, we have our prisoner description cards. We hold prisoner description cards dating from 1895, and these combine the kind of information found across all the records we've talked about so far in this webinar, including a jail photograph of the prisoner when it is available. Please note that these photographs are duplicate copies of the ones on the photographic description sheets. If they were not photographed on the description sheets, they would not have a photo on their prisoner cards. These cards act as an overview record of an inmate's history across the various New South Wales jails. Of particular interest is the detailed information on their prior convictions and incarcerations. Here we have an extract of a prisoner card for a Frank Anderson. On the front of the card, we have a small photograph of Frank, along with basic identifying information, including his date and place of birth, Belfast Island, details of his arrival in New South Wales, arrived 1870 via the city of Glasgow, and his various aliases, including Smith, Wilson, Stewart, Bradshaw, Johnson, and James Wilson. These cards also provide particulars of an inmate's employment, both prior to their conviction and during their incarceration. Here we can see that Frank was employed prior to his conviction as a labourer by the New South Wales Department of Public Works. Unfortunately for Frank, it also notes that he was unable to regain employment with Public Works after his incarceration. Of note is also a listing of punishments Frank has received during his incarceration at Parramatta Jail for possessing tobacco and other contraband, as well as disobeying the wardens. For each offence, it notes his punishment. In all cases, isolation in his cell. The back of the card details Frank's previous convictions. Calling this record a card might be a bit of a misnomer as there are several pages of cards detailing Frank's prior convictions all attached together. This is just one of those pages. The card provides dates of the conviction the name he was convicted under, so when he has used his various aliases, the court and magistrate which convicted him, his offences and sentences, and finally, the various jails where he has been incarcerated, including Darlinghurst, Parramatta and Balola, along with his dates of entry and discharge. I also just wanted to quickly highlight this card as being an example of someone who was employed while in prison. You can see under his trade and occupation, Larkins is listed as being both a shearer and a labourer as a free man, but he was also employed while in jail to provide the service of knitting. Not what you would expect looking at his jail photograph.
The annotations on these cards can also be a valuable source of information. Here we have the prisoner card for Elizabeth Miller, who was convicted of murder in 1896. Although the description sheet for her, which is digitised on our website, only notes her initial sentence of death, the card provides us with further information. It notes that Miller's death sentence was commuted to penal servitude for life and that she was transferred soon after her conviction from Darlinghurst Jail to the Parramatta Hospital for the Criminal Insane. A later annotation on the card indicates that she was transferred to the Free Division of Parramatta Asylum almost two decades later in 1915. While I've shown you lots of examples of information rich cards, many of the prisoner cards provide only basic information like this one for John Lennon. No photograph is provided and only one conviction is listed. This conviction is for being a reputed cheat, a charge for which he served almost two months in Young Jail. Now that we've covered some of the typical jail records you can find in our collection, I wanted to spend a bit of time highlighting some of the rarer and more unique jail inmate records that we hold. My intention with this section is not to make you think that we hold these records for every jail, but to encourage those of you who are interested in doing a deep dive into the jail records to look at what holdings we do have for each jail outside of the main series and seeing whether they might be relevant to you. Here we have a letter book from Maitland Jail, which holds copies of letters sent by the jailer and the visiting justice. Letters sent by the jailer, dated 1841, we learn of the repeated escape attempts made by the convict William Jones, who arrived in Australia per the Burrell. Three escape attempts are described. During the first attempt, Jones cut his irons to make his escape and was quickly caught and confined to the cells. He then proceeded to use the wood on his cell floor, which was in a state of decay, to remove brick from the wall before being caught, removed to a different cell and repeating the process. For his efforts, he received 50 lashes and one month of confinement. However, the jail expressed concern about Joe's continued presence in the jail, stating that the prisoner states that, use what means I may, it will not deter him from endeavoring to make his escape. From these circumstances, I respectfully beg to bring under your notice the very insecure state of this prison and the damage and consequent expense of repairs that may be incurred by such a determined character. From Goulburn Jail, we hold a warrant file for an Arthur Frederick Aldred. Aldred was convicted for a combination of bigamy, stealing, embezzlement and forgery in 1920 and was sent to Goulburn Jail for his incarceration. Not long after his imprisonment, Goulburn Jail received a memo from the State Penitentiary asking whether they held any prisoners who would be suitable for the position of organist within the jail. Aldred is one of the candidates put forward by the jail and is ultimately decided to be the most suitable for the employment as an organist, despite not having the most relevant experience. A memo in his warrant file notes, Aldred is only a pianist, but he would no doubt be able to pick up the organ after a little practice. And here we have his transfer paperwork from Goulburn Jail to the State Penitentiary, the reason being that his services as an organist is required. Definitely an insight into the prison during this time period that the services of an organist was considered essential to the operation of the jail. And we even have a record of how much Aldred earned for his services, receiving a bonus of three pounds for his labour. Finally, I wanted to highlight this file with petitions from prisoner John Douglas to the Comptroller General in the 1930s. Douglas, who was in the middle of serving a 15 year jail sentence, asked to be allowed to serve the remainder of his sentence at a prison farm. The petition states, while he is greatly appreciative of the interest taken in him and the assistance and the encouragement given to him by the officers at the reformatory with whom he comes into contact, he feels that the open air life would improve him physically and enable him to show better results for the time expended on his studies. Unfortunately for Douglas, his initial petition was denied and a second petition was sent in the following year. This petition went into much more detail about how his transfer to a prison farm would assist him in his studies to ultimately become an optometrist. 
he speaks of his prior experience both with horses and mechanics which would make him an asset to the prison farm written at the very beginning of the second world war his application then concludes with the following statement the prisoner also wishes to state that in the event of the nation requiring added manpower in the present war he would be eager to offer his services and if accepted he would be of greater value to the country any experience gained under camp conditions would be to his own advantage and to the country's should he be given an opportunity to offer his services although his case is acknowledged to have merit douglas's long sentence remains a setback to his application as there are many other comparatively short-term prisoners awaiting vacancies in the prison camps However, it is noted that should his conduct continue to be satisfactory, they may be able to fit him into the prison camp later that year. So now that I've shown you some of the wonderful jail inmate records held in our collection, how do you go about searching the records yourself? The first thing you'll need to determine is when and where your person of interest was incarcerated. Many of our early entrance and description books have been indexed and digitized via Ancestry's New South Wales, Australia, Jail Description and Entrance Books 1818 to 1930 collection. You can search these records by name, jail, date of admission and year of birth, or you can browse by each jail and type of record. Although Ancestry is a subscription website, it is freely available via our Western Sydney Reading Room, as well as many public libraries. As mentioned previously, we have also digitized and indexed jail photographs in our collection dating between 1870 and 1930. You can search this index by name, aliases, place and date of birth or jail to locate entries that are relevant to you. These can be searched either via the index page on our website or directly in the catalog. Further jail records, which have not been indexed or digitized, will need to be viewed in person via our Western Sydney reading room. If you are unable to locate your person of interest via the online sources, or even if you're hoping to search for additional records we might hold, you will first need to have an idea of when and where your person may have been incarcerated. New South Wales Police Gazettes are an excellent source for tracing people throughout the criminal justice system. They report on wanted criminals, arrests, court sentences, and prisoners released from incarceration. Similarly to jail inmate records, Police Gazettes are closed to public access for 70 years. Police Gazettes 1930 and prior have been digitised and made searchable online from home. You can search and browse these early Police Gazettes via either Trove or Ancestry. The New South Wales State Archives Collection also holds hard copies of post-1930 Police Gazettes, which can be viewed in our reading room. These gazettes are arranged by year and have an index located at the front of each volume. On screen shows an example of the kind of information which can be found within the police gazettes. This is a notice from 1891 reporting on the apprehension and impending trial of Richard Francis Brownett in the Broken Hill Circuit Court, charged with stealing two grey ponies. This gives a researcher a time period and local area to begin searching for records. However, one of the most useful forms of information provided via the Police Gazettes are the returns of prisoners discharged from jail. Here is an extract of a 1935 Police Gazette return. You can see that this tells us when and where each prisoner was discharged from, as well as their place and date of conviction, providing us with numerous avenues for further research into the records. We also have several indexes to New South Wales court cases available via our website and the catalogue. Here is just one example of an entry from our Criminal Indictments Index. This notes the sentence of several individuals who were tried in the Wagga Wagga Circuit Court in 1875 and where they were to serve their sentence, with Daniel Abbott and Edward McCabe both going to Goulburn Jail, while George Thomas would serve his time at Wagga Wagga. Historical newspaper accounts can also be a great way to determine if someone has been incarcerated. Here we have the reporting of the sentence against John Douglas, whose later prisoner applications we've already seen, noting that he was sentenced to 15 years in jail for the wounding of a constable in 1933. Details of court proceedings were also often published in local newspapers during this time period. References to a person's incarceration may also be found in many of our other popular records which are listed on our website such as our letters to the colonial secretary, 
our divorce records and our probate or and deceased estate records, say if a person died in prison. Death certificates, which are held by the New South Wales Registry of Births, Deaths and Marriages, may also know if a person died in jail. Here we have a prisoner statement which can be found in one of our divorce case papers. In this statement, inmate Leonard O'Reilly says that he does not intend to defend the divorce suit but requests that he be granted reasonable access to the child of the marriage. Once you know the jail and time period of incarceration, you can start searching our collection to identify any relevant records we may hold. A great way to start your research is by looking through our available resources under Subjects A to C. Simply go to our homepage at mhnsw.au and click on Explore State Archives. Then click on Subjects A to Z. Our Subjects A to Z contains our online guides, indexes, articles and webinars for our most popular research subjects. You can use the filters at the top of the screen to limit it to only guides or only indexes. Click on a letter within the alphabetical panel to navigate to a relevant topic. Because we're interested in jail inmate records, we will select G for jail. We can then click on jail inmates and prisoners to bring up all our relevant guides, indexes and webinars. So if you're interested in convict jail records specifically, you may want to look through our guides for some further information and search tips. Our most popular resource, however, is our Jail Inmates and Prisoners Photos Index, which I've already mentioned a few times in this webinar. Here you can search across all our digitised photographs by name, alias and jail. Click on the details link to bring up the full record in our catalogue. From this record, you can view all the data attached to the index record, including the prisoner's name, place of birth, and the date the photograph was taken. You can also view the description sheet itself by clicking into the image gallery. From here, you can view the photograph and save it onto your computer. However, the majority of our jail inmate records are not searchable by name, like our jail photos index. Instead, you'll need to search our collection for rec records we hold for the particular jail and time period you have already identified. To do this, simply go to our homepage at mhnsw.au and select Explore State Archives. Then type in the name of the relevant jail into the search bar and click Enter. In this case, I'm looking for records from Wagga Wagga Jail. This will bring up all the records listed in our catalogue with the keywords Wagga Wagga Jail. As you can see, there are a lot of results. The majority of these records won't be relevant to you. You can narrow your search by using the Tweak My Results filter on the right of the screen. Clicking Series will limit to just the series or collections of records relating to the jail. And now we've narrowed down our results to just 36 record series. You can browse these series by title and date range to identify what might be relevant to you. Click on the title to bring up further details about the record series. Here we have the full catalogue entry for this series of records, which provides us with a brief description of the kind of information they can provide. We can see from this note that there are four volumes within this series. They also provide you with what we call a stroke range. Each stroke number, for example, 6 stroke 5512, represents an individual volume within the series. The series record also tells us that item lists for these records are not available online. We do have more detailed hard copy listings of these records in our reading room, which can indicate the date range of each individual volume. At this point, you would need to contact us to obtain these listings and come into the reading room to view the original records themselves. Alternatively, here is another record series in our catalogue that provides some slightly different information. This tells us the records in this series has been copied onto microfilm reel, which is freely available to view in our reading room. This is also a strong indicator that copies of the record will be available via the Ancestry website. Another great way to search for jail records in our catalogue is to select the agency record for the individual jail you are interested in. This will provide you with a brief description and history of the jail, but most importantly, under the link section, it will provide you with a preview of the series created by the jail. Clicking on see all series will take you to all the records created by this jail. And here we have 35 results of which you can browse. 
So as mentioned previously, the New South Wales State Archives Collection holds records from all aspects of the criminal justice system. I've briefly spoken about our Police Gazette records, but we also hold several records relating to New South Wales court proceedings. We hold Supreme Court depositions dating back to as early as 1824, although there are many gaps in the records. All criminal Supreme Court records are closed to public access for 75 years. Similarly, we hold depositions from the Court of Quarter Sessions, now the District Court. There are many gaps within these records, with only a few boxes of depositions surviving for the period 1841 to 1920. Our Court of Petty Sessions depositions, now local courts, are even sparser, with few records surviving prior to 1950. Both of these jurisdictions have restricted access to the records for 60 years, with all records relating to children as victims or perpetrators of a crime now closed to public access for 100 years. We also hold transcripts of Supreme Court and Quarter Sessions court proceedings from the court reporting branch. We don't hold a transcript for every case heard, but those that we do hold are a wonderful resource and provide much insight into the trial. The majority of court reporting transcripts are open to public access after just 20 years, but there are some cases which have been identified as being closed for 75. If you are interested in pursuing research into the court records, I would recommend checking through our various online indexes and guides. So in this case, we would go again to our subjects A to Z and click on C for courts. And here we have two different subject areas, one for the higher courts and one for the lower courts that you can browse. So that wraps up our webinar on jail inmate records. Thank you all so much for coming along and learning a bit more about our collection.